You're listening to the Soul Strategies podcast hosted by the team here at Soul Strategies. We hope you like the latest episode and thanks for tuning in. Go. All right, it's doing something. And then it'll go. It's downloading or something. All right. Okay. Okay, I think we're live. Yes, we're live. Okay, everybody, welcome back to our Soul Strategies podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Phelan Dante, and he is running in New York. So I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about his campaign, who he is, and why we're so excited to have him here. Hi, Imani. Hi, Phelan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. So yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Phelan Dante Fitzpatrick. Um, you know, I've been a New Yorker uh, for over 20 years. Um, and, you know, I, I take great pride in my community and um, in my neighbors and my fellow New Yorkers. Um, I've been a small business operator uh, for the past 16 years. I also have a small business in my district. Um, I'm a um, a dad. I have a beautiful four-year-old daughter. Her name is yeah, Artemis. So um, thank you. She is the light of my life. Um, you know, there's a uh, there's a lot going on in New York City. Um, you know, so I uh, I think it's really important um, right now for people of color to get involved in politics. I think now more than ever, um, especially people in the LGBTQ uh, plus community. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Now is the time to really make a difference, uh, to stand up for what we believe in. And um, I think also, you know, when you when you have a small child and you are committing to raising her in a city like New York, mm -hmm. it, it really raises the bar, uh, the standards um, for what you think is important for your values. And when you feel that there are people in office who represent you, who don't understand your values, who don't represent your values, mm -hmm. um, who can't empathize uh, with what's going on in your life and with your small businesses, with your employees, um, then not only is it your right to get involved in local politics and run for office, but it's your responsibility. Absolutely. That actually leads me into your my next question. Since you mentioned your background, have you faced any specific prejudices because you're running as a Black gay politician in New York? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are really starting off hot, huh? Um, look, I... I think it would be really easy for me to say that, you know, as a, a candidate of color, as a, a gay candidate, that right now during these times, it would be really easy to run um, for a local office. But the fact of the matter is it, it's not. Um, I think it's really easy to say uh, that you support black lives um, until you have to vote for one or until one is seeking an endorsement from you, or until one is you know, looking for fundraising for their campaign. Um, I think that the status quo um, is powerful in New York City. Um, and I think that sometimes it really takes someone to kind of look outside of themselves and their own situations and their own skin in order to be able to empathize with um, communities, especially marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes people are very comfortable voting for someone or endorsing someone who uh, looks and talks like them. Right. I think that's a good point. That's actually accurate and we've been seeing a lot of that lately with the rise or the new spark of white supremacy going on in the country um what do you think distinguishes someone who runs for power versus someone who runs for the cause because i've been seeing a lot of that i've been seeing lately in politics that we have people who are interested in running for office but it's not for a specific reason they don't have a platform that they're passionate about and they don't seem to have an end goal what do you think is the most important way to distinguish yourself from those type of candidates well i think um, you know, we all think of New York City and New York City politics as being very progressive. Mm -hmm. um, but from my experience so far, 
I have learned in a very short amount of time that New York City is progressive in ideology, but not necessarily in action. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in, in public service and I believe that all New Yorkers and, and citizens of this city and of this nation, uh, generally, no matter what our backgrounds or professional experiences, we can apply our sense of service and commitment to the community. Hey, you're listening to the Soul Strategies Podcast. Take a moment to listen to some of our esteemed champions and their takeaways from the program. Uh, it's, it was very important for me to manage uh, time. And the program, again, helped with the discipline of time and helping with the management of time so that, um, so that you can actually structure yourself to do that what you desire uh, uh, for your races. For more information, head over to soulstrategies.com now. And, and run to represent the needs of working people in this city and in this country. Unfortunately, you're always gonna have people who are gonna run for office uh, simply for the power that it gives them. Mm -hmm. And um, New York City politics is really no different. In fact, it's really kind of a, the representation of how sometimes um, there are other reasons for running. And um, I, I think that uh, we're gonna be facing a lot of those issues um, in this upcoming election, especially when it comes to uh, for-profit interests in the city because they're powerful. Definitely, definitely. Well, what are some of the main reasons that you are personally running? What is it that you want to accomplish for your district? Um, I think as a small business operator, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's really what got me into this race in the first place. And I remember when we had to shut all of our stores down mm -hmm. from the closures, the mandatory closures, I remember in March um, calling the office of the city council in my district and um, I was scared. You know, I just laid off 40 people, 40 employees uh, who have been working for me for several years. Um, and I was going on unemployment myself, you right. know, after 16 years being a small business operator mm -hmm. in the city. And it's a pretty terrifying experience. You know, all of a sudden you're in a situation where you have to choose between paying your rent and mm -hmm. buying groceries. You know, I have a, a young daughter um, and no one in the city council office never ever called me back. Right. And I thought it was strange. And I, and I kept thinking to myself, well, there's a global pandemic going on. You know, mm -hmm. surely they must be helping other small business operators right. or, you know, they're helping to you know, f fight the pandemic and, you know, deal with so many people being in the hospital and people dying, but mm -hmm. actually, what it was is my city council representative uh, and his chief of staff were mm -hmm. both running for office. Uh, they were seeking endorsements. Mm -hmm. They were fundraising hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to secure themselves jobs while the rest of us were losing ours. Right. And I, I found it to be disturbing um, and not representative of the values that New Yorkers um, have, feel and deserve. Um, I'm one of them, you know, not only am I a candidate, but I'm a constituent. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found that to be um, upsetting and, and sad. And so that was one of the biggest reasons why I, um, I jumped into the race in the first place. You're absolutely right. And that is a, nationwide issue. We have a lot of politicians who are taking money from corporations or they're more so focused on fundraising, focused on lining their own pockets that a lot of the constituents are being ignored and they're not representing the people at all anymore. They're representing their donors. So I think it's really cool that that's an issue that you've raised and that you're aware of and you're fighting against that. Well, you know, uh, every candidate needs to fundraise. Um, right. and, and it takes a lot of money to uh, run. run for office in the city. Mm -hmm. But to that point, you know, my lead opponent, who was the chief of staff at the time, mm -hmm. was getting paid a city salary of mm -hmm. $164,000 a year while still in office, right. while seeking endorsements, while fundraising hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, if you want to run for office, that's great. But don't collect taxpayer money Mm -hmm. with your paychecks that you've never missed a single one. And while you're still in office, you know, fundraise and seek endorsements. That's, that's not right. And then I started to think more about it. It's like, while I'm collecting unemployment checks, you know, taxes are being taken out. Mm -hmm. Well, those taxes are being taken out to pay for our representatives Mm -hmm. who are running for office, seeking endorsements. So, you know, I found it to be uh, wholly problematic and um, unethical. Definitely. I can agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. Well, we've seen a big shift in politics on a national level. What do you hope to see out of this new administration? Do you see- Have we seen a shift in yeah. politics on a national level? <laughs> Not yet, but um, I'm hoping. That was my question. What do you think is going to happen? From with, this? With, our new, with our new president. Yes, we've transitioned power after a hard fought battle that <laughs> democracy barely clinged on, but we just squeaked on by with our democracy. And we know the Democrats have been given a chance to make a difference. They have the majority in the House and the Senate, and they have the presidency. So what is it that you hope to see from the nation on a national level? Um, I, I think probably the most important, I think for this new administration mm-hmm. is going to be um, racial equality Definitely. across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, I think equal protection under the law. I think getting our small businesses back up and running, mm-hmm. funding. I think ending mass incarceration uh, in a, on a national scale. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any hope of a national recovery from the pandemic um, unless there are efforts to end mass incarceration in this country, period. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. We're talking about billions of dollars that are lost for people of color in this country every single year, simply because they, you know, have been in the the criminal justice system at one point in their lives. They will continue to pay for it in their Mm -hmm. lives. That's true. Um, So, you know, I know I feel very good about this administration. It's um, wildly um, um, I think representative of our values and uh, and what we all, well, at least half of the country think (laughs) think is important. I think so too. I was, I've been watching certain things that Biden has been doing with like his executive orders and stuff. And I was like, wow, is this, is this what a decent human being is like? Like, it's crazy that, you know, in the whole time that the other party had the presidency, there was no positive legislation push. Like there, they had no positive agenda was just a lot of undoing. I saw that Biden had to do an executive order to undo Trump's ban on um, uh, sensitivity training. Like it was just, it's just crazy the things that came out of that administration. So it's, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can just, we have a lot of work to do. And there's a big splinter in the middle of this country. There's people who just do not see eye to eye, will never agree and don't want progress in America. They just don't want it. And so we have an uphill battle, you know, trying to win over those people if we can, or just even get anything passed. The diversity of the administration alone yeah. is, you know, is unbelievable mm-hmm. and um, makes me hopeful in, in a lot of ways. I think we're still uh, suffering from PTSD from the past For sure. four years. I think that honestly, I, I have felt like I've had, you know, a a terrorist on my phone, on my news, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. in my home, you know, every single day for the past four years, it's like Mm -hmm. you wake up every single morning and like, what the hell is going on? It's always something. Doesn't, didn't seem real in any Mm -hmm. way, shape or form. Um, So I I have great hopes for this administration and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what both of them can do to, you know, turn this country around and to fix things. I do too. Do you think that as a nation, MAGA was like a phase or do you think it's just going to develop into something else that we'll have to face in four years? Uh, We have a problem with racism in this country. That's facts. We have a problem with racism uh, within our law enforcement. We have a problem with racism in our education system. 
uh, in employment in this country. Um, it, it's just pervasive. It just seeps into every facet of uh, our lives. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you're a person of color, um, and I, I don't know why pe people have such a problem talking about race and the fact that we do have racism. Yeah, systemic it's, racism I mean, in, it's in every level. Latent. If it wasn't clear in t before 2016, we've come to a point where it is absolutely positively laid out clear and there's no debating it. And just like you were saying with the equal protection under the law, we're seeing how this summer when protesters were fighting for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and they were just peacefully protesting, how brutalized they were, how they were terrorized by police officers and law enforcement in those communities. And then we've seen their white male straight counterparts storming the Capitol building, threatening to murder lawmakers and hang the vice president and they're not even a lot of them aren't even being charged with crimes and then the crimes that they are being charged with are petty crimes so it just shows us that there's a two-tier justice system in this country and it shows you which side that people of color are on and people with a more progressive mindset and the right-wing white establishment in this country it just plainly lays it out now yeah you know um going back to progressivism, mm -hmm. uh, especially in New York City. You know, I was saying before that, you know, people like to say that they're progressive, but really only in ideology and not in action. Um, mm -hmm. I have received um, several emails to our campaign website with people very upset um, with the things that I have said about law enforcement in the city mm -hmm. um, and racism. They think that my campaign is divisive. Uh, you know, if anything, they want more law enforcement because they feel our our streets are unsafe. You know what's divisive? Um, Being racist. Well, that's divisive. Yes. <laughs> However, these a lot of people in New York City in our in our country actually don't think that they are being racist. Mm -hmm. And what I've discovered, um, I'm not a sociologist. You know, <laughs> I'm just uh, you know a person of color who's been living in New York City for over 20 years, mm -hmm. that when it comes to law enforcement, it really is a factor of two things. Um, what color your skin is and your socioeconomic status Correct. in New York. Mm -hmm. And I think partly you know, in the country. Um, if you are not a person of color and you've never experienced stop and frisk, mm -hmm. if you are not, you know, Part of the trans community and has, mm -hmm. has ever been stopped by you know law enforcement for just being yeah. just for just living or mm -hmm. existing um you know then you you will never understand why bad policy leads to bad policing yes um i i i don't have a problem with law enforcement i have a problem with racist law enforcement and unfortunately, um, I have a problem with bad policing policy. Correct. Um, these all need to be fixed. 100%. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, we're never going to be a united country unless we start really, you know, making an effort um, to solve these really big fundamental problems that we have in this country. The only, and I 1000% agree with you. I think that is the only positive thing that came out of this past administration is it, it has, the veil has completely dropped. We can no longer sweep racism under the rug. We can no longer sweep police brutality under the road, under the rug. We can't pretend like all of this stuff isn't happening anymore. We've had people proudly assert that this is who they are, this is what they stand for, and this is what they want. And now we're down to a point as a country where we have to acknowledge it and fix it, or just plainly admit that we are not a democracy and we are not a country that has freedom for all and equal protection and civil rights. We have to stop per perpetrating and pretending that we as a nation are something that it's plainly clear that we are not. Right. So I think it forces us to literally draw the line and if you need, if you want us to be one, not one nation under God, then say that we need a new constitution. Then, like, we need to just stop pretending that this American dream and this American propaganda is real, and we need to either fight to work towards being that nation that we claim to be, or be honest about who it is that we are and lay it out. 
We're well, we need to do both. both. We need we both. need to do we need to be honest about who we are right now. Mm -hmm. 100%. And then we need to talk we need to talk about what kind of country we want to be mm -hmm. and um and what kind of city we want to be. And um you know, I'm just glad that those we're in a position and we have leadership now will I think will facilitate those conversations so we can get to a better place. I totally agree with you. I agree with you. Well, I know you've got to run. So I thank you so much for coming on today. And thank interview you, Imani. I was so happy to talk to you today. Me too. You had some great insight. You did too. You did. You're really I, smart. And uh, I, I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you too. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you Thanks, guys. Imani. for Bye. And good luck on your campaign. Thank you, Imani. Bye. Bye, y'all.